it's 64 degrees. This prison bars are broken. We shall rise. We shall rise. Welcome again to Counterpoint. I'm Mike Hickson, and with me as always, Brother B.J. Clark. B.J., great to be with you today. Always enjoy being with you. I love talking about the Bible. Thank you, Mike. B.J., today we want to talk about the devil and prejudice. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the devil is identified by Paul as the god of this age, the god of this world. And he is also identified as the prince of the power of the air. And he is the adversary of man. And one of the ways that the devil, one of the tools that the devil uses to really divide and conquer people mm -hmm. is prejudice. And it's sad to say that in our country, prejudice is alive and well. Yeah. And many people are prejudiced towards others. And the basis of the criterion for their prejudice is race and gender, some because of education or lack thereof, uh, some because of finances, others because of position, power, uh, fame, whatever. How, how do we counter this whole attitude of being prejudiced towards one another when the Bible over and over again appeals to us mm -hmm. to love one another. That's right. That reminds us all that prejudice is a learned behavior. It's not something children come out of the womb thinking of hateful, hateful thoughts about someone that's a different uh, gender than they are or different to skin color than they are, different educational status or economic status. Jesus is certainly not the one we're imitating if we're prejudiced because in John 4 and verse 4 there's an interesting statement about Jesus. He said he must needs go through Samaria. Now he was Jewish. That's right. And as you know from Bible geography studies, where he was, the quickest way to get from Jerusalem to the northern part of Galilee would have been to go through Samaria, but that's not the way they typically did it. Because they wanted to bypass that part of the world, mm -hmm. they would come across the Jordan, go up, and then come back across and completely bypass Samaria in their travels. Why does John 4, 4 say Jesus must needs go through Samaria? There was a woman there. That's right. And she even thought it was astonishing. How is it that you being a Jew are talking to me, a woman? That's right of Samaria, so all these different things going on, and uh, Jesus was as interested in her soul as he was in anyone else's, and he spent the rest of the time uh, talking to her. She said, point blank, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Right. There was a racial prejudice there. The Samaritans were actually a mixed breed, part Jewish or Hebrew, along with foreign blood as well, and so the Jews could They looked down upon them. They, they looked upon them as half breeds, as they would have put it, and Jesus didn't tolerate that, not, right. not whatsoever. Well, you know, what's interesting, th this woman really had a couple of strikes against her. Number one, well, three. Number one, she was a woman, right. because women in that day and time were looked down upon by uh, by men. Mm -hmm. uh, a second was, she was a Samaritan, she was a half-breed, uh, the Jews despised them, and as you pointed out, what John said, his commentary, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And then the third strike, she had been married five times, and the man that she was now living with was not her husband. Mm -hmm. So I mean, this woman was living in immorality. Uh, she was, uh, uh, you know, she was, uh, uh, well, uh, just a despised, scorned woman by many, many people. Right. And yet Jesus took the time to to discuss with her some very important principles that she needed to hear and made a great difference in her life. Absolutely. And you know, uh, Jesus was just as loving and gentle with her as he was with the Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. They, That's right. The conversations are recorded back to back, one in John 3, the one in John 4. And Jesus was always looking for those who were in need. It did not matter to him what their gender was. Uh, the Syrophoenician woman uh, was longing for uh, him to reach out to her, and he commended her uh, faith for reaching out to him. So this idea that uh, 
God is approving of our racial prejudices ignores the bottom line truth that God made of one blood That's right. men of all nations, Acts chapter 17. And so in God's mind, there isn't this distinction. Six times in the New Testament, you find the phrase, God is no respecter of persons. Mm -hmm. And the most literal rendering of that would be, God is not a face looker. That's right. He doesn't look at my face to determine whether he will or will not accept me or love me, and I'm glad of that. Uh, he doesn't care about the color of my skin. You can dye Easter eggs any color you want to, but there's still eggs there's on still the inside, inside of that shell, and that's uh, what you and I need to keep in mind. Yeah, you know, in, in Genesis chapter 1, when God made man, the Bible says he made man in his own image and in his own likeness. Now, that part of us that's like God is that we are an eternal being. Mm -hmm. we, we have a soul, a spirit placed within us that will live forever. But as you mentioned a moment ago in Acts chapter 17, Paul very succinctly pointed out that God has made of one blood all nations of men to dwell together. We all have the same father. Mm -hmm. We all go back to Adam. We all go back to the same mother, Eve. And, and you know, when I look at, at some of the tension that exists in our world today, we need to learn to live together peaceably in this world. And, and you mentioned, uh, you, know, you know, we talk about race and the Samaritan woman mm -hmm. uh, and gender. That's another problem. I, I think about people's position. In Matthew chapter 9, when Jesus went into the home of Matthew, Matthew was a tax collector. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders of that day, they asked the question, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Mm -hmm. well, you know, how, how could the Lord stoop? To, to, to sitting with somebody like that. Right. And yet Jesus said, oh, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. What, they, they didn't realize that they were sick. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, somehow we've got to get people to understand that on the inside, we're all the same. Yes. And God makes no distinction. And as you mentioned a moment ago, God is no respecter of persons. And I, I, I said a moment ago that the devil, one of the great tools that he uses is to divide and conquer. In Matthew 12, 25, Jesus said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. There's a lot of tension in our country right now. Yeah. And a lot of that tension exists between the races, between blacks and whites. Uh, sometimes because of our ethnic backgrounds, there, there is tension that exists. And, and yet, I guess maybe the question is, uh, what, what would God have us to do? You know, if we could just get people to unite by following the Ephesians formula, remember Jesus was able to take Jews and Gentiles mm -hmm. and bring them together, reconcile them, together in one body by the cross. Mm -hmm. Ephesians uh, chapter uh, 2 tells us that's exactly what he did. Verse 14, he is our peace who hath made both, both Jew and Gentile, right. one, broken down the middle wall of partition. Verse 16, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And you know, you think about it, the Jews and the Gentiles didn't have a fond opinion of one another. In fact, it's recorded that some Jews were going around saying the only reason God even made Gentiles is to have something with which to fuel the fires of hell. Now, that's a pretty blatant, brazen, prejudice judicial statement if I've sure ever heard is. one. The only reason you exist is so that God can damn you to hell and you can keep the fires burning. What a terrible thing to say. And yet that's what uh, they believed and taught. How did Jews and Gentiles sub suddenly come together in one body? That's right. The cross was the uniting factor. Yes, it was. As they all realize their sinfulness, they realize, wait a minute, more important than the color of my skin is the stain of my soul. That's right. And you know what, BJ, you just made me think about something, and that is in Acts chapters 10 and 11. You know, you talk about this prejudice that existed between the Jews and the Gentiles, and it was so, it was such a breach between the two that God used a man by the name of Cornelius, mm -hmm. a Gentile, a man that was obviously devout, he worshiped God, he prayed, he gave alms, and yet God used him to show Peter and the other Jews that the Gentiles were to be included in God's redemptive plan. In Ephesians chapter 3, the, the very book that you appealed to a moment ago, mm -hmm. God 
told the Apostle Paul that his plan, that is the mystery that had been concealed but now revealed unto the prophets and holy apostles, was that the Gentiles might be a part of the same body. Fellow heirs, right. That's exactly right. Yes. And so, how did God bring that about in the church? Isaiah 2, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established and all nations shall flow unto it. That's right. It was always God's plan that as part of his household, all nations would flow unto it so that it could then be said in Ephesians 2.19, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, you're fellow citizens with the, with the saints. saints and of the household of God. That's right. That's exactly. And that's a beautiful picture. You know, in Matthew chapter 28, when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Going right back to Isaiah chapter 2, mm -hmm. that was God's plan from the very beginning to house both Jews and Gentiles in the one body. And the beauty of the church is that it's big enough and broad enough to house all people. Uh, absolutely. And I think of Luke's account, which mm -hmm. echoes what you said in Luke 24 49. He said, uh, actually, verse 47 is the one I want. He said, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you know, you think about the hatred of the Jews that goes on over in the Middle East. Uh, I don't believe, as uh, some preachers do, that the Jews are still God's chosen people and that he's going to give them land in Palestine. Joshua 21, 43 to 45 makes it abundantly clear they got every particle of land God promised them. That's right. But I don't believe that we ought to hate Jews just no. because of Arabic descent. And you know, if you think about how long-standing these racial divides can be, Abraham doesn't want to go along with God's plan to let Isaac be the one, so he gets with Sarah's handmaid. Here comes Ishmael, mm -hmm. and now here comes Isaac. The descendants came from Ishmael. Mm -hmm. The Hebrews and Jews came from Isaac. And think about the friction that existed back then and how it's still That's here so centuries later. Racial prejudice is an extremely powerful and volatile thing, and it's long-lasting. And long-standing. Uh, as you mentioned a moment ago. And you know, I, when I think about that account in Genesis chapter 15, I'm reminded of the fact that when God has a plan, He doesn't need help. <laughs> you you know, Abraham and Sarah thought they needed to help God out uh, by getting a handmaid. God didn't need their help. Right. And, and the, the promise would go through Isaac. You mentioned a moment ago the Samaritan woman. In Acts chapter 1, after Jesus had risen from the dead prior to ascending back to heaven, he told the apostles that they would be witnesses of him mm -hmm. in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And then he said, to the end of the earth. Over in Acts chapter 8, we have the first record of the gospel going to the Samaritan people. As you mentioned a moment ago, the Samaritan woman. In Acts chapter 8, the Bible says that Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. God thought enough of them, mm -hmm. thought enough of them to send somebody to preach the gospel to them. Right. And in Acts chapter 8, verse 12, the Bible says, When they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. When they were baptized, they were then added to the body of Christ, Acts 2, 47. Right. And as you mentioned a moment ago, the, the cross was that unifying factor that brought both Jew and Gentile together in the one body. And so God is interested in all people, in the, in the souls of all men. And I tell people today, sometimes, uh, and this is not the same exact thing, but it shows you that people with differences of opinion can still be united under the banner of the cross. And uh, you've got your uh, folks today who believe in homeschooling, those who don't necessarily choose. I've seen folks in the church get all crossways with each other, and I tell them, look, if the Jews and Gentiles could get along in the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, I think the homeschoolers and the non-homeschoolers can so. find a way to get together. And you could take that and just go down the list with it. Now, that doesn't mean that every issue is uh, a matter of opinion, but it does mean that on those areas that are matters of opinion, we can still be united by the cross of Christ right. and by Jesus. In fact, 
I can't help but think of a place that was suffering from division, and I, when I look at Paul's method for dealing with it, it can't be accidental. That's the right. church at Corinth was in tremendous conflict. They were at each other's throats. The devil must have loved it. Uh, there were all kinds of uh, prejudices, not s necessarily racial as much as, 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 as there were preacheritis, so to speak, so that Paul uh, deals with this, and he starts off. He says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. And then verse 2 mentions sanctified in Christ Jesus. And then later in that same verse, to all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 3, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 4, I thank my God always for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. Verse 5, you're enriched by Him. Verse 6, the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Verse 7, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, God is faithful by whom you're called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, <laughs> brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you get the idea that he's trying to Trump get home. their focus off of anyone but but the Lord. Jesus Christ as the source of unity and he says if you'll do that you'll all speak the same things you'll be perfectly joined together in the same mind the same judgment verse 10. Tremendous thought tremendous thought yeah, you know we talk about the church and and the bringing together of people from varying backgrounds educational backgrounds gender race whatever and and you cited a moment ago Abraham. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, God said to Abraham, In you shall all families of the earth be blessed. That promise was fulfilled, primarily speaking, in Christ. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, Paul said, You're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. As many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And then here's what he said There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor free, female, for you're all one in Christ. That is, you're one in Christ Jesus. Yeah, you know, if we could somehow get that in our heads, yeah. that the place where the reconciled, the redeemed are, the church, and the, way, and, the, and the place where all the barriers are broken down again mm -hmm. in the church. What does that say about the importance of preaching Christ in the church to the world? Absolutely. And this idea that we can't be assimilated together in the same group in the same church is completely destroyed by Ephesians 2. There was a Gentile element to the church at Ephesus, but there was also a Jewish element. They were worshiping together, right. and if they could get along, then I can get along worshiping with my brethren of a different color, That's and right. uh, I can go down the road of uh, <clears throat> believing in Jesus Christ, and if they go down the same road and believe in Jesus Christ in the same way he said, we'll be in fellowship, joined yeah, you know, together. You know, that's a great, that's a great thought, Brother B.J., because I was just thinking a minute ago, when we're in Christ, doesn't matter if it's if it's a male, a female. Doesn't matter, you know. Doesn't matter your, your educational back, background. Uh, you know, you know, what, your power base, whatever. Mm -hmm. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're that's brethren. Right. That's what Paul said in Colossians one. We're that's brethren, right. and and you know that's the real unifying force. B.J., I know one of the things that. Uh, one of the things that has really uh, become very prevalent in our country, we, we talk about our judicial system, our uh, government, our civil government, our police force, our police task force, and we understand the purposes for, for the police, our military, et cetera. And in, in, no, in no way would I ever try to justify injustices. And, and clearly there have been injustices in days gone by regarding race, for one. And, and yet sometimes in, in the face of an injustice, people will become uh, very inflamed. And, and I understand emotions run high when, mm -hmm. when people are mistreated and sometimes, uh, sadly, even lives are taken. But sometimes the tendency if an injustice occurs, is to riot, mm -hmm. to loot, to burn, to destroy, right. uh, to throw rocks, and 
uh, you know, you know um, every form of violence for the most right. part. Yeah. And I guess my question is, is this the right way to bring about justice? If we're upset with how something has been handled with our judicial system, with our law enforcement, with whatever, what, know, what's, what's the best way to react? It's described in 1 Peter chapter 2 and uh, verse number 22. Jesus did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. And the Bible says in verse 21 that we ought to, that he left us an example that we should follow his steps. Look, uh, even if injustice has been done, and as you said, sometimes it has, even if it has been done, that does not license us to then become vigilantes for justice. What did Jesus say when the injustice of putting him to death as an innocent man took place? Did he look down from the cross on those who were guilty of such and say, get them, Lord? Or did he try to, uh, you know, start a riot, inside a riot to, uh, you know, deal with this? Why did Jesus say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Because he had this attitude of compassion right. and a desire to bring together rather than to divide. And he was humble. I think that's the part people miss about racial prejudice. It's often rooted in a pride right. that is, uh, and it works both ways. Some are proud that they are not a certain color. Mm -hmm. Some, because they are not a certain color, feel that they've been mistreated. And sometimes they have. Mm -hmm. And so they become so focused on that one issue that they forget that they are still human beings and that these people who are different color are still God's people. And so really, it's, it's a matter of understanding that it's not about racial color as much as it is internal characteristics. I think you're right. And you know, one of the, I think really the taproot of what we're talking about, it's an issue of the heart. Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, we, we can use any kind of word we want to, want to use to try to discuss to describe it, but ultimately it goes, it goes it back to the heart. It sure does, yeah. And you know, I think about, you know, have injustices been done to individuals? Yes, don't, don't deny that. And, and yet in Romans, chapter, in Romans chapter 12, Paul said, uh, uh, do not be wise in your own opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, and he mentions, do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. You were talking about being, hum uh, being humble a minute ago. Right. He said, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Then he said, beloved, do not avenge yourselves. And you cited 1 Peter chapter 2. Jesus was reviled. He reviled not again. He suffered. He didn't threaten. And then he said, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirst, give him a drink. For in so doing, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Mm -hmm. You know what, if we would put that in practice, yes. a lot of changes would well, come you forth. Know, you're right, I'm glad you drew our attention to the judgment because people aren't getting by with anything. No, no. And this idea that if we don't settle this, it will never be settled, completely leaves God out of the equation. God knows what's been done. He knows who really did what to whom. That's right. And if there's somebody who thinks they're getting by with something just because a court of law said they're innocent when they're not, or if they've gotten by with it because of their position or power of authority, they haven't gotten by with anything. God's going to be the great equalizer on the day of That's judgment. Right. Right. And he's the supreme court of all supreme courts, and he will judge the quick and the dead, and he's going to judge them fairly. And one thing my mom and dad taught me that I really appreciate, <laughs> I didn't at the time always, but I do now. Son, if you do something wrong, we will love you still, but we will not defend your wrongdoing. That's right. And some people have this attitude that love for someone that's your child or someone that's of the same gender or race that you are, love means you have to approve of everything they do and that you can never criticize anything they do. That's not love. That's right. Love sees the need to change 
and helps you make that change that's right. uh, because you love someone, and that's true love. That's, that's right. You know, Paul said, love rejoiceth not in iniquity. Right. And in John, in the book of John, in 1 John chapter 4, John said, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. God is love. Right. And, and uh, you know, if we don't love and care for one another as we ought to, then, then you know, we'll suffer the consequences. B.J., one of the things that uh, uh, I think you pointed out that I think is really a, a very important point is the fact that injustices may never be settled here, but there's coming a day in God's court when all the injustices of, of life will be settled mm -hmm. equitably, fairly, and we can depend on that. Abraham asked the question many centuries ago, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? God's going to do what's right. Absolutely. We've got just a couple of minutes or so left. What are some principles that would, that would help people get beyond the barriers of prejudice? Well, I think uh, deny self is one of the key principles in all things. Jesus was willing to deny himself. And so many people want to talk about my rights being violated, this, that, and the other. And don't get me wrong, I don't think we ought to trample over people's rights. But uh, this idea that uh, my rights have been violated it leads to division because people walk around in this era of political correctness with their feelings on their sleeves just waiting to be bruised, that's a, that's, that's a form of, of pride as well, as if, if you hurt me, how dare you? I think we have to, number one, be Christ-like. When he was uh, in a human body, he showed us the ultimate example about how to treat fellow man. If I go out every day, Mike, and I try to be like Jesus, uh, I can never go wrong doing that as long as I'm following his example. I think that's a great point. You remember years ago, people used to wear the bracelet, what would Jesus do? I think right. that's a good question to ask. And you know, ultimately, we might also ask this question, what will Jesus do? Because one day, the way we treat one another, we're going to be judged for. The golden rule, Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, Jesus talked about how treating other people like we want to be treated he said, this is the law and the prophets. And I think, you know, if people would just recognize, look, you know, I want to, I want to be treated as a human being, mm -hmm. fairly, equitably, and, and, and I ought to treat other people like that. Right. That's, that's the bottom line. And again, no one ever has problems in society because they're doing what God says. It's when people choose to do something other than what this book says that creates all the chaos. And when these people get on television and shout, and scream about how to fix things, I say, I can show you something, but you don't want to listen to it because you don't want to be told what to do. You want to tell others what to do. But ultimately, don't we need to ex admit that what we're trying in this world apart from this book is not working and that we need to get back to the Word of God and uh, it can take care of all of our relationships, the home, society, all those things. You know, Isaiah identified Jesus as the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. And when Jesus was born into this world in a human body, the angels of God said, peace on earth, goodwill yes. toward man. And ultimately, that's what we're striving for. Amen. BJ, thank you so much for those words of wisdom. And thank you for being a part of our program today. We hope that it has been helpful. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Until then, God bless. <laughs> Selected. Selected. Screen recording. Button.